Hello, and thanks for clicking back on another one of my videos. This is one of two Macintosh classics I purchased on Facebook Marketplace. As you can see, it has seen better days, and unfortunately, it no longer powers on. The chassis has also been beat around and is scored with some very deep scratches. Years of deterioration has turned the plastic yellow, which is a common problem with machines of this vintage. In this video, I'll be restoring this computer as well as upgrading it with some cool new features. Before we start with the restoration, let me give you a bit of a history lesson on this machine. The Macintosh Classic was released in October of 1990. It was primarily aimed as a low-cost computer for homes and schools, and notably it was the first Macintosh to sell for less than a thousand US dollars. It contained a Motorola 6800 processor that clocked at 8 MHz and 1 MB of RAM, but this could be expanded to a maximum of 4 MB. This particular computer belonged to a local high school. The man I purchased it from told me it was once used for graphing mathematical calculations in math class. Of course, to restore the Macintosh Classic, the first thing we have to do is open it. There are four Torx screws on the back of the machine, which I have already removed. The top two require an extra long driver. With the screws removed, the case can be cracked open. If the computer has never been opened before, it can be quite difficult, but I recommend against using any tools, as this can damage the plastic. You should be able to pop the panels apart, with a bit of elbow grease and prying. With the back panel off, it can be put to the side. As you can see, I've already removed the hard drive from this machine. Next, I remove the memory expansion module. With it removed, any connectors on the logic board can be unplugged, and then the logic board can be slid out from the back of the machine. With the logic board free, the analog board and CRT can be unplugged and removed from the machine. Be cautious when working with these components, as they contain extremely high voltages. I recommend placing the red anode cap in an anti-static bag to prevent it arcing on any metal components. The first thing to restore is the logic board. Luckily, the battery in mine had not leaked, but the capacitors are defective and need replacing. After washing the corrosion off the board using isopropyl alcohol, I get to work on removing the old leaking capacitors. There are eight capacitors on the logic board that need to be replaced. As these caps are quite old, I found the easiest way to remove them was with a pair of pliers. Just be careful not to rip the pads off the board if you use the same method. Once the housing of the capacitor has been removed, you can snip the legs off as well. Next, I clean the exposed pads with some isopropyl alcohol and reflow them with some fresh solder. I chose to replace the existing capacitors with tantalum ones, as these are what I had on hand.
Next, we start on the analog board. First, we have to remove this plastic shield, which is held in with some clips. As you can see, there is a lot of damage to the back of the board. This is caused by the aged capacitors leaking electrolyte onto the PCB. I start by removing the most badly affected caps, making sure to take note of their positions on the board. Next, I clean the affected area thoroughly with some solder braid, isopropyl alcohol, and Q-tips. Any excess corrosion can then be carefully scraped off. I then proceed to clean the entire board, as it's coated in a thick, sticky layer of what I can only assume is excess flux from the factory. Isopropyl alcohol makes quick work of this. I also clean the other side of the board, where the affected caps used to sit. There, this looks much cleaner. While the board is out, I decide to remove the rest of the capacitors, as they might as well be replaced also. Now that all the capacitors are out, I remove the excess solder from the empty sockets using some solder braid. I then insert all the replacement capacitors. The keen-eyed among you might notice that I put some capacitors of the wrong value in, but not to worry, I fixed that off-camera. With all the new capacitors in, it's time to solder them in place.
Now that all the electronics have been repaired, it's time to make this case a little bit more presentable. I've decided to try out a common rejuvenation technique for yellow plastics, known as retrobriting. It works by essentially bleaching the yellow plastic using hydrogen peroxide and a UV light. Once the chemical process is complete, it should return the plastic back to its original colour. I prepare the case by removing any remaining emblems and pieces, and then take it outside to be thoroughly cleaned. Any dirt on the case could interfere with the retrobrite process. I scrub the plastic thoroughly with soapy water. Toothpaste helps to remove any tough to remove dirt. Now that the case is clean, I fully submerge it in a water and hydrogen peroxide solution. The amount you should use varies, but in this case I used about a litre of 12% hydrogen peroxide. Then I wrap it in UV LEDs. All that we have to do is wait. Luckily for you, I have the power of editing, but for me, the whole process took about 48 hours. The case came out perfectly. For the rest of the case, as well as accessories, I follow the same process. I'll do you a favour and gloss over the hours of labour. Now that all the restoration work is done, we can reassemble the computer. I start by cleaning the metal chassis. I can reinsert the Apple logo into the front plate now as well. Next, I install the CRT and newly recapped analog board. The logic board is now slid into place. While I'm at it, I also clean out the fan. While the hard drive in this machine still works, I wanted a method to easily transfer files to the computer. I discovered this fantastic device known as the Raskuzzy an adapter board that lets you turn a Raspberry Pi into a SCSI hard drive. This is incredibly convenient, as it allows me to do tons of cool things, like transfer files over the network and even get my classic connected to the World Wide Web over Wi-Fi, no less. Unfortunately, the Raskuzzy was out of stock at the time of making this video, so I had to make my own. Luckily, the instructions and design files are all available online for me to make one myself. As the resistors are normally installed on the kit versions available online, I decided not to show the process of soldering them on. So instead, I'll show you the process of installing the easier components. The first thing I installed was these four large chips, which I have affectionately dubbed the dog chips. I think you can figure out why I named them this. One thing to note is that the orientation of these chips is important. Ensure you align your chip with the dog patterns on the silkscreen. To make life easier, make sure to use flux, as this will help a lot with these smaller soldering joints. That's the bottom half of the chips all soldered on. Make sure you repeat the process for the top half. Next, I solder this little dip switch into place. The micro USB port can be quite finicky to install and isn't technically necessary depending on your setup. So if you're not super comfortable with soldering it on, just don't bother. Now for the DB25 connector. 
If you only plan on installing your Rascuzzy internally, then you don't need to solder this one on either. Next up is the internal SCSI header. This one's also quite easy to install, but make sure you don't mess up the orientation. Lastly, we need to solder on the GPIO header for our Raspberry Pi. Now that the Raspberry is assembled, we can connect it to a compatible Raspberry Pi of our choosing and then power it on. Fantastic, it powers on as expected. Now we can install the operating system and the required software on our Raspberry Pi. Using the Raspberry Pi imaging tool, I install a fresh copy of Raspbian to an SD card. If you want to hook your Raspberry Pi up to Wi-Fi, you can also configure your network settings using this tool. Once the installation is complete, you can install the SD card into your Raspberry Pi and boot it up. You'll then want to SSH into the Pi using its local IP address. The default username will be Pi and the password is Raspberry. Once you've gained access to your Pi, it's as simple as running these three commands, which can be copy-pasted from the Rasksy GitHub page that I have linked below. When the software is installed and running, you can check to see if it is working by accessing the Rasksy web console. Simply open up your web browser of choice and enter the URL raskc.local. From this page, you can upload any software you like to your vintage computer, and even change disk images on the fly. As I want to install my Raskuzzy internally, I designed a bracket so it could be securely mounted inside the chassis. I have uploaded the bracket to Thingiverse, should you wish to print it off for yourself. After a quick 3D print, the bracket is ready to be installed. Installing the Raskuzzy onto the bracket is very straightforward. I mount it to the bracket using some threaded nylon standoffs and screws. Then I screw the whole thing onto the original hard drive. To power my Raspberry Pi when it's mounted inside the Classic, I put together this simple wire harness, made out of a Molex splitter and old micro USB cable. Now all I have to do is slide the old hard drive and Pi into the Classic and plug everything in. If you were so inclined, you could wire up both the hard drive and the Raspberry simultaneously, using a SCSI cable that has multiple headers. For my Classic though, I left the hard drive unplugged. Lastly, I reinsert the memory expansion module and put the back case on.
The last thing we have to do is get an operating system installed on our Macintosh. With the Raskazi, this is incredibly easy. There are a couple of operating systems made specifically for the Raskazi on Macintosh Garden. Simply download the operating system of your choice and import it to your Raspberry Pi using the web console. Once imported, you can unzip it and mount it to a SCSI ID of your choosing. Once the image is mounted, you should see it in the table at the top of the screen. If you want the computer to boot to this operating system on startup, all you have to do is save the operating system as your default boot configuration using the Save button. OK, the restoration should be complete. And you know what that means? It's time for a tech montage. Thanks for watching. You might have noticed it's been almost a year since my last upload. While normally I would attribute this to my own laziness, this time I actually have a reason for it. Between my home flooding and having to move out all my furniture and equipment, getting COVID, traveling overseas, getting evicted and then getting unevicted, it's been truly a hectic year for me. So I'd really appreciate it if you could give this video a like and maybe even share it to some of your friends. It's been awesome to see the support you've given me and my channel. I promise I've got many more cool things to show you all in the future. So take care, and I'll see you next time.